last Sunday after church, since we're redoing my kitchen, uh, I went over to my favorite place in the world, Home Depot. Uh, and, uh, and, you know, you have to go on. Now you can go online instead of driving to each one of them and find exactly what you want because it says on the computer what's there, which is totally awesome. Did you know this? Yeah, so uh, I, I uh, don't normally go to the Alexandria Springfield, but I've been there several times as I've been buying, you know, vast quantities of baseboard and stuff for my house. Uh, so they had a, they had one little part that I needed for a door, uh, and uh, so so I so I drove over there after we had, we had lunch. <laughs> so I get there, and so my wife's like, "Hey, could you return this one thing to Home Depot that we're not going to use?" And I'm like, "Sure." So I went in the so I, Liz went with me, uh, and she didn't go in. She wanted to stay in the car. I can't figure that out. That's why wouldn't you want to go in? Um, and <laughs> they actually built a Home Depot behind uh, one of my homes in California, right behind my fence. And one Friday night, we were sitting there when they opened it, and I said, uh, you want to go on a date? She's like, sure. I go, let's just go walk around the tool corral for a while. And <laughs> anyway, back to my sermon. So I, I, that didn't go over well. Uh, so I left her in the car. Uh, it was a beautiful afternoon, and I walked in with my little vent thing I needed to return. So I, went up, I walked right up to the customer return. You, on a Sunday, I walked right up. I was like shocked. This is like a miracle. There was no one in the store. And so I asked the young guy, I'm like, like hey, where is everybody? He goes, sir, it's been this way all day. He said, I bet you we've averaged five people per hour in this store on a Sunday. It wasn't even a holiday. I'm like, this is unbelievable. This is awesome. So I returned my little vent, got my money, and then I went walking over to the hardware section to find what I needed. So I got over to that aisle, and this got something to do with my sermon, in case you're wondering. I don't meander, okay? So I get over to the, I get over to the hardware aisle, and I'm looking through all the boxes of the little, little uh, joint that I need, uh, and there's two workers standing there with the little bibs on, you know? And uh, so I'm standing there looking for my, what I need, and I couldn't find it. The box is empty, you know? So I used to work in, in, in a warehouse, so I'm looking up above me at all the stock, all the numbers, you know? I don't see it up there either. I'm like, oh, can you believe it? It said they had it. And so one of the, the workers, uh, his name was Muhammad. Uh, it was, he was the guy that ran the, that area. Uh, he turned to me and said, uh, could I help you? I said, well, yeah, I, I, this is what I need, and I can't find it. And it's online, it says you have it. He goes, well, it's, it's right here. And so they, they had like one. And, and so I got what I needed, and, uh, and <laughs> I said, thanks for blessing me. And he said, oh, it's my, it's my joy to bless you because God has called me to bless people. Do you walk through that door? Uh, I did. Uh, I said, well, God has, I said, God has blessed me too. Uh, not just with the part, but he's blessed my life because I said, I've obeyed his word and, and sought light, not darkness. And he goes, well, that has been my life. He says, uh, I am from Sierra Leone, and I am a, I'm a, I'm a imam in my local Islamic center. I'm the teacher. He's like the priest, the preacher, if you don't know what that is. He's me, <laughs> in case you're wondering, like, what I'm talking about. Uh, yeah, uh, he's, he, they, they use, like, lay teachers. I actually, I, I'm not lay. I get paid, so, but it's the same thing. Anyway. Uh, so he's an he's a imam in an in a, in a, in a Islamic center of teaching. And, uh, and, and so we began to talk. We talked for a long time because why? There's no one in the store. <laughs> this was awesome. It was like divine design. There's no one in the store, no one to distract them. And here we are. And so he actually leans over on all, all of the boxes that were there. And he makes himself comfortable. And he asks me this question. He says, um, you know, I don't ever get to talk to a pastor. He said, would you mind if I, ha I have some questions? Could, could I pose my questions to you? Well, not today. I'm kind of busy. The wife's in the car. <laughs> Marriage is on the line. No, I, no, I said, sure. You know, fire, fire away. I'll call her. Uh, you know, uh, she's used to losing me in stores anyway. So, so I said, no, no, go right ahead and uh, fire away. So, and I'd already, already told him about my background. He wanted to know where the church was. You know, he wanted to know a bunch of, he wanted to know what I had studied in my lifetime. I told him about my degrees in the Old Testament and stuff in Hebrew. And so he's like, whoa, uh, so you're like a scholar. I said, well, yeah, I guess. And um, so he said, okay, I, I have some questions. And I said, okay, fire away. So let's, let's talk. So he, question number one, is Muhammad in the Old Testament? He's smiling. He's waiting for a yes. What do you think he got? He got a no. I said, uh, well, actually, no. I said, uh, never seen his name in English or Hebrew. Never seen his name, Muhammad. Never seen it. it he's not in the Torah. He, he's not in the prophets. And he's not in the writings, the historical books. He looked very bewildered at that point. He had a follow-up question. 
Question number two. Is Jesus in the Old Testament? Hmm. That's interesting. Uh, what do you think the answer was there? Yes. Oh, yeah. I said, oh, is Jesus in the Old Testament? Oh, he's everywhere. He's all over the place. You cannot just read without bumping into him. He's, he's in there. They, he's prophesied about. Uh, they, they talk about his purpose, his mission, his job description, what he'll be like. There's 60 exact prophecies that are specific. Uh, and, and I said, hey, it, it is those prophecies of Jesus, those specific prophecies, uh, are the reason why I believe that he's, he was the God-man. He was the Savior. And I said, this is the reason why we as Christians are not looking for a, a future imam to come to rescue us. He goes, Really? He goes, well, show me Jesus in the Old Testament. Uh, I am still married, but I was in that store for quite a while. Uh, <laughs> so I'm just truncating a long conversation. But I, but I said, well, let me show some, share some texts with you about who Jesus is and how you see him in the Old Testament. Uh, and so we had a very interesting conversation, not combative, not angry. I would make statements. He would make statements, observations. Uh, he, was, uh, he said at one point, he goes, you know, I'm very sad how my religion has been hijacked. And the concept of jihad has been hijacked. And I said, you're absolutely right. Because jihad could be spiritual struggle with your carnal man, or it could be physical struggle against unbelievers. And, I, and he goes, that's absolutely right. They have hijacked it when it should be internal struggle. So I asked him, well, if it's internal jihad, you fighting against your sinful man, what better way to fight the sinful man than to know the Messiah? You see what I mean? You know, sometimes God puts in front of you witnessing opportunities in the most bizarre locations. You know what I'm saying? I mean, I had no intention when I walked into Home Depot to, ha I was, I told Liz I'll be right in and out. <laughs> Parking lot's empty. Uh, don't worry about me. I'll be right in. Uh, and I was, you know, when I came out afterwards, I mean, because eventually a lady walked up and needed to part. I had to tell Muhammad goodbye. But I did tell him, you know, Muhammad, uh, now that I know the department you work in, next time I come in, I'm going to come, I'm going to look you up. We're going to have a conversation. He goes, oh, good. And, uh, and I said, and secondly, uh, you need to think about the things I told you concerning Christ. Because this is significant. Because I had told him the vast difference between the Quran and the Old Testament was the lack of prophetic power. It lacks prophecy. Why? Prophecy can only come from God Almighty. So I said the Quran might have dictates on moral behavior, blah, blah, blah. But it lacks that thing you would expect if it was from God. So I said, you must think on these things who Jesus is. So when you run into somebody at Home Depot this afternoon, if you're out shopping, <laughs> or if like 300 of you show up at the, you know, <laughs> Alexandria to find Muhammad, uh, <laughs> what do you tell them? I mean, what do you tell them about Jesus? Uh, the most famous Psalm of all the Psalms is 110. I mean, you could just camp here and we're going to camp here for two weeks because uh, two Sundays, because there's so much here. I know there's only a few verses, but they are deep. There's a ton of information here about who's, who's the Messiah. Uh, because this is a, the Psalm of David is going to answer the question, what are the roles of the Messiah? Which is what I went through with Muhammad. What are the roles of the Messiah? What was prophesied concerning him? And all we're going to do is look at today from this very famous Psalm, uh, that verses one to three, he, his first main role was that he would be the, the true king. He'd be the king of kings. That, that's who he would be. Uh, not just any old king, but, but the king. And he would be, by definition, the eternal king, because the eternal king, which suggests he's divine, which is opposite of what Islam teaches, that, that Jesus is a prophet, but he's not God. He had to be, by definition, divine to fulfill all of the covenants, the Abrahamic, the Palestinian, you know, the Mosaic, the Davidic the new covenant, Jeremiah 30, 31. He, by definition, to fulfill those eternal covenants had to be eternal. Well, that's exactly what Psalm 110 says. So you could take Muhammad or anyone like him and say, who is Jesus? What does the Old Testament say? And this royal psalm is also prophetic in explaining who the king would be. But I want to acquaint you with Islamic teaching because you run into it when you go shopping at Home Depot <laughs> or other places. So uh, having gone through the Quran when I was in doctoral school, working on my uh, doctorate in apologetics with Dr. Geisler, um, we had to deal with the Quran. So we knew firsthand what did it say. So it says in Surah, uh, verse four, uh, or, or chapter four, verse 171, O people of the scripture, do not exaggerate in your religion and do not say about God except the truth. The Messiah, Jesus, the son of Mary, is the messenger of God. Do you agree so far? 
Okay. Uh, and his word that he conveyed to Mary and a spirit from him. So believe in God and his messengers and do not say three. Three what? Well, three and one, monotheism. Refrain, it is better for you. God is only one. Glory be to him that he should have a son. Uh, and to him who belongs everything, the heavens and the earth, and God is the physician, a sufficient protector. So in their version of things, God is what we would call strict monotheistic system. God is one in so far as I can completely understand his oneness. I would suggest to you, which I, I did with another young Muslim man that I led to Christ before I moved here from California, he got saved on the concept of Genesis 1-1 where it says, in the beginning, God. I said, you believe the Torah, don't you? Yes. Then why does it say in the very first beginning verse of the Bible that in the beginning, Elohim, plural, created everything and is translated as singular? Hmm. And then I took him over to Deuteronomy 6.4. Behold, O Israel, the Lord our God is one. I said, you understand, echad in Hebrew, one can mean one in singularity or one in complexity. Which do you think is the God who created the complex cosmos? The one that I can pare down and understand or the one I cannot understand in his oneness? See, the Muhammad that day, he rejects the Trinity of Christ. That's what proves his deity. Uh, Surah uh, chapter 9, verse 30 says this. The Jews said, Ezra is the son of God. And the Christians said, the Messiah is the son of God. These are their statements out of their mouths. They emulate the statements of those who blasphemed before. May God assail them. How uh, deceived are they? You're deceived if you believe that in the Trinity, is what he says. You're deceived if you believe Jesus was the son of God and he, he was deity status. What does Psalm 110 say? The exact opposite of that. His job description was when he comes, uh, he will be the king of kings, lord of lords, and he will be the very God of very God, as we're going to see. Surah chapter 5 of the Quran says this. They disbelieve who say God is, uh, is the Christ, the son of Mary. Say, who can preve prevert God, if he willed, from annihilating the Christ, the son of Mary, and his mother, and everyone on earth? To God belongs the sovereignty of the heavens and on earth and what is between them. He creates whatever he wills, and God has the power over everything. Verse 73. They disbelieve who say, God is the third of the three. Uh, but there is no deity except the one God. And if they do not refrain from what they say, a painful torment will follow them who disbelieve. The ironic thing is the painful torment will follow those who disbelieve in the Trinity. So that's the thing. There's a, there's a bunch on the line here. This isn't two theological systems vying for the same God. These are two theological systems that are antithetically opposed to each other. What does the psalmist tell us? Well, that when the, when the Messiah comes, he comes as God in the flesh. And that the Trinitarian concept, which I can't develop the Trinitarian concept today for you, uh, uh, that is clearly articulated throughout the Old Testament and the New Testament, uh, we will assume it to be true, but it is taught all through the scriptures because God in his greatness uh, is complex to understand. And even all of our definitions and analogies that try to describe his oneness fall flat to try to grope and understand him. But as I've said before, as uh, Dr. Erwin Lutzer said uh, many, many years ago uh, at Moody Bible Church, um, he said, uh, idolatry is reducing God to a manageable proportion. That is what idolatry is. If I pare God down to that which I can understand, that's not God. So what does the prophecy say? Let's look at it. Verse 1, what do I tell that person when I run into them? Who is Jesus? What has he done? Um, so it says in verse 1, this is a psalm of David. That's part of the Hebrew text. It doesn't look like it in your English text, as I've told you before. It's written up at the top, usually italicized. That's really verse 1 of the Hebrew text. So David wrote this. So since David wrote this psalm, this prophecy, that means that he wrote it between 111, uh, 1011 B.C. and 971 B.C. Or he wrote this a thousand years before the birth of the Messiah around 5 BC. A thousand years. He got this from God, this revelation. What does he say? He says, the Lord, Lord, capital L-O-R-D, says to my Lord, capital L, small, small O-R-D. Let's just stop right there and analyze. We're going to analyze this uh, line by line, phrase by phrase. You're probably not shocked, correct? Uh, this, the Lord says to my Lord, is what he says God told me a thousand years before the Messiah would come. So this is Yahweh, the eternal God, uh, speaking to uh, Adonai, Lord. Why two different names? Well, Father and Son. 
See, Jesus could be the son of God because he, by definition, was the eternal son of God. See, in Islamic teaching, they're thinking God, who is holy, had sex with somebody and produced the child. No, he didn't. He was purely actualized. He always was. So was the son. I mean, this is what Jesus says in John 8, 58, when they ask him, you were before Abraham? And what does Jesus say? Before Abraham was, I am. I'm, I am the I am. Anyway, back to my sermon. Uh, the Lord says to my Lord, David says. So Yahweh, God, uh, speaking to Adonai, God, uh, they are both eternal. So, so much for the strict monotheism of Islam. Because what he says here, now you have, dual, you have at least dualism. You have the Father speaking to the eternal Son. And it doesn't take much to get over to the Spirit. Because you see the Spirit in, in Genesis chapter 1, verses 1 to 3. Do you not when you read it? And the, the Spirit of God hovered over the surface of the waters, the Ruach, the Spirit of God. And so Trinitarianism laced through Genesis chapter 1. So interestingly, Jesus used this text uh, several times in his debates with the Pharisees who denied his deity status, just like Islam does. They denied his deity status uh, as the son of God. Uh, and Jesus quotes Psalm 110 many times to uh, sense his argument with them that he is the divine son. So if you read Matthew 22, verses 33 to 40, uh, he is... Uh, entertaining combative questions from the legal experts of the, uh, the Pharisaical class. Uh, and when he handles those questions well, uh, he then goes on the apologetic offense. Now, you don't know, uh, apologetic, uh, apologia, the Greek word means to defend. It's a Greek term used in a court of law. So when I tell you I got my doctorate in apologetics, I, I didn't get a doctorate to apologize. <laughs> you, you understand? I mean, I got it to defend. So it's like a legal term, and if you're an attorney, you understand this because this is you're trying to use reason and logic and data, et cetera, to prove your point and win your case. So Jesus goes on the apologetic uh, offense, not defense. In verse 41, notice what he says to the Pharisees who deny his divine sonship. Now, while the Pharisees were gathered together, Jesus asked them a question. We'll just stop right there. Would you want Jesus asking you questions? Ah, oh, let me step out on that one. Um, he said, hey, what do you think of the Christ, the Christos, the anointed one? Um, whose son is he? Uh, you know, they're freaking out at this point. Well, they, they, they said to him, well, he's the son of David. Where'd they get that from? Psalm 110. And he said to them, uh, I have a follow-up question. Uh, then how does David in the spirit call him the son, Lord, Kyrios or Adonai? And the Lord, you know, he says, let's quote Psalm 110. The Lord said to my Lord, sit at my right hand until I put thine enemies underneath thy feet. If David then calls him Lord, the divine one, how is he a son? You guys just said you agreed with the, that, the, that the Messiah would be the son. It says so in Psalm 110, what his role would be. Whose son is he? What he's showing them is he's more than just a human son. He's a what? He's a divine son. And he said, I am here a fulfillment of Psalm 110. I am David's son. I'm from the line of David. All you have to do is go back and read the genealogical list of Matthew chapter 1, or, or, or Luke's account as well, the genealogical list where his uh, Davidic origins are clearly articulated. He says, I'm not only a son of David, I'm David's Lord. <laughs> Shocking. Did they buy that? Oh, no. See, as the God-man, the Davidic Messiah would... Uh, uh, would be completely fulfilled, uh, uh, as we have said, the eternal concept of, of, uh, of the covenant because he's the eternal king. He's the ultimate Davidic king. So the Lord says to my Lord, sit at my right hand until I make thine enemies a footstool for thy feet. Uh, when, it, when it says, the word says, says, uh, there's different ways to say this in Hebrew. Uh, the, what, says, what it says here in the Hebrew text, which is different than uh, what you might anticipate, uh, it's the word oracle. That's, and it didn't translate the word oracle, but that's the word in Hebrew. It's, it's, uh, it's the word oracle. What's significant about that? Well, an oracle is of divine nature. And since the divine oracle originates in God himself, nothing is going to stop its fulfillment because it's a divine oracle. By definition, it has to be fulfilled. So the Lord says to my Lord, sit at my right hand. This is the father speaking to the son uh, until I make thine enemies a footstool for thy feet. Uh, what, did, uh, what did Jesus tell Caiaphas when uh, he was on that trumped-up trial? Uh, Matthew chapter 26, verse 63. Here's what Jesus told Caiaphas, based on Psalm 110. But Jesus kept silent, and the high priest said, to him, said unto him, I abjure you by the living God that you tell us whether you are the Christ, 
the Son of God. And Jesus said to him, you have said it yourself. So to all of those, and if you're sitting here today who's, who make the statement, Jesus never claimed deity status, guess what? Yes, he did many times, and he just did here. You said it yourself that I am the Son of God. I am the Christ. I am divine. He says, I tell you, hereafter you, the high priest, shall see the Son of Man sitting where? At the right hand of power and coming in the clouds of heaven. Then the high priest tore his robes, saying, he has blasphemed. Blaspheme. Uh, the Greek term blasphemeo means to say cursed, evil things, like vile gossip about somebody. He is blasphemed. He says, what further need do we have witnesses? Behold, you've now heard the blasphemy. Why? What was the blasphemy? Jesus said, based on Psalm 110, I am the divine son. And the high priest who knew Psalm 110 rejected it outright. But Jesus says, well, you're going to live to see me seated at the right hand of the father. Uh, as prophesied in Psalm 110, verse 1. Peter later uh, says this in 1 Peter 3 about the position of Christ. He says, Jesus Christ, who is at the right hand of God, having gone to heaven, into heaven after the angels and authorities and powers had been subjected to him. So when Jesus died and ascended in uh, Acts chapter 1 on the Mount of Olives and went up into the heaven and the angels stood and told the disciples, what are you looking at? I think that's actually the most funny. Could you imagine, what would you tell the angel at that point? It's Jesus rising into heaven. That's what we're looking at. And they're like, hey, as he, as he has gone, he's coming back as prophesied. Uh, he's the king. Where did he go? To be at the right hand of the father as prophesied. Uh, Hebrews chapter one says this about Jesus, verse three. He, Jesus, the Messiah, is the what? Radiance of his glory. Whose glory? The father's glory. He's the radiance. And number two, he's the exact representation of his nature. Whose nature? Well, the Father's nature, divine nature, the exact representation. Uh, and he upholds all things by the world of his power. So who's the glue that holds the entire cosmos together? Jesus. And he does it by his very word. He is God. Uh, or, uh, he, when he made purifications for sin, uh, what did he do? Well, he sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high. Why? It was prophesied in Isaiah or in um, uh, Psalm chapter uh, uh, 110 verse 1 that that he would he would ascend that's what that prophecy was not exactly what he did but notice what it says here he's the radiance of the glory of God so what the father is in his Shekinah glory Jesus has the same Shekinah glory and when Jesus steps apart on the Mount of Transfiguration from his physical body as it were to allow Peter James and John uh, to see his greatness what do they see but the Shekinah glory of God Almighty and then he also says he's the exact representation of his nature. He's the exact representation of the divine nature of the Father. Uh, this Greek word, character, like our word character, character, uh, it, it denotes an engraving tool or, or an impress made by a die or a seal. Uh, so you could say, as it were, and this analogy breaks down, but that's what the lexical word means. Exact representation. So the Father is the, is the, is the die, and Jesus is like the clay, and boom, uh, he's exact representation. Or if they're making coinage, he's an exact representation of what's on the face of the, of the die when it's made. Uh, it breaks down because that's denoting that there was a time when he wasn't. You see what I mean? That's, that's where the lexical meaning breaks down, because Jesus always was. But the concept is he's the exact representation of the nature of God. All the divinity that the Father has, Jesus has all that divinity. So what do I tell Muhammad? Who is Jesus? And what does it say in the Old Testament about him? Well, it says that when he comes, uh, he, he's going to be God. He'll be the Lord, Adonai, which is used in the Old Testament of God. Once more, Islam theologically is off base on that point, And they need to be guided toward that which is truth. Uh, Psalm 110, coupled with New Testament text just mentioned, tell us a completely different story about who Jesus is. He's the risen Messiah himself who went to the right hand of the Father, uh, and he's waiting for what? This is most interesting. What, he's waiting, and there's a little prepositional phrase there. He's told uh, to sit at the right hand uh, by the Father until I put your enemies under your feet as a footstool. This is interesting. A footstool, uh, once you put uh, your feet on a footstool, it meant total domination. So the father tells the son after the resurrection, here, son, sit, it, sit to my right. And while you're sitting there, I am going to take over uh, everything on the, on the planet Earth and, and work things in geopolitical history and all, ideological time. And all, I'm going to take over all of that. And I'm going to use it to usher in the kingdom, the messianic kingdom, the Davidic kingdom of the Messiah. as prophesied. 
So what does that tell us? That, that, that tells us that no matter how bad things are in our, in our, in our country, as, as, as politicians try to move us from being independent people to being dependent people, and we worry about what we see, what does Psalm 110 tell you? It's an oracle from God. Nothing can stop it. It's God the Father, God the Son, and God the Spirit working to bring in the King and the kingdom. And Jesus is sitting on his throne right now, waiting while his Father works strategically through all world events to bring all things to fruition. I tell you what, I find hope in that. I find great hope in that. Preposition is very important. Wait here, son, until I bring a little lex talionis, a little eye for an eye. I switch things around. Um, he says, I will make your enemies a footstool. Uh, if you are taking Hebrew at Dallas Seminary, if you attend Dallas Seminary, some of our people do, uh, just for the, the geeky Hebrew people um, on us, that is an imperfect tense denoting durative action, meaning God the Father is constantly working. Doesn't matter who got voted in, who got voted out, who's running this, who's running that, what our enemies are doing, not, not, whatever. Because what, what really matters is God is on that throne always working to bring in the Messiah as prophesied in Psalm 110. He's the king, and he's going to be the Davidic king. So no one or nothing can thwart, thwart or stop or interrupt the plan of God. So it kind of makes you wonder, like, well, what is God doing in this process? Because it's a mess, isn't it? I mean, I've watched it all my life since the, you know, the 60s and beyond, watch things kind of unravel. So I'll give you a brief perusal of what, kind of what we're studying on Sunday nights when we study the book of Revelation. Uh, and when we start again la- next week, we'll be in chapter 10, by the way. Uh, so you can still catch up. Uh, there's a few to, a few to get through. Uh, here's a brief perusal of God's uh, orchestration of, well, dealing with evil and bringing in the king. Uh, I'll I'll give you a couple concepts. What's what's God doing in that process? Number one, it's prophesied there's going to be a worldwide apostasy, a falling away from truth as we know it. Is that not the truth? Our country, as educated people, are walking away from Aristotelian logic and logical thinking left and right as prophesied. And then they fall away from biblical truth. Number two, according to Zechariah 12, uh, Jerusalem will become the focus of worldwide hatred. Do you not see that? Uh, Just the last attack on Israel's southern border in Gaza uh, is an illustration of how people in our nation turned against Israel like you'd never seen before. It's prophesied. Uh, 1 Thessalonians 4, 13 to 18 talks about the rapture of the church in explicit terms. That's the next thing that will happen. Uh, Revelation 4 to 19, God's going to deal with Israel, uh, time of Jacob's trouble, according to Jeremiah, and unbelievers during the seven-year tribulation. That's God working from his throne to put the enemies of God underneath his feet of his son. So when his son comes, he takes the kingdom. Uh, There's more that God is doing, just to give you an idea of what he's doing. Uh, Jesus is the Davidic king. He's going to appear a second time at the end of the tribulation. He comes with great glory and clouds. He destroys all the armies of the godless that invade Palestine, according to Zechariah 14. Go read it. It says he does. Uh, Chronologically, the next thing that happens, Revelation 20, Jesus binds the devil. And cast him into the bottomless pit for a thousand years. Jesus rules and reigns on the Davidic throne in the millennial temple in Jerusalem, articulated all throughout the Old Testament. Uh, and it's only given time parameters in, in Revelation 20. It tells you how long it's going to be where Jesus rules and reigns. And at the end of the kingdom age, uh, God allows the devil to be loosed one final time. And he creates insurrection and rebellion against the rule of Christ. And God the Father wipes out the rebellion. And then the kingdom of the Messiah emerges with the eternal kingdom. God's in control. Peace. He maintains peace. This is all important. Revelation tells us there's 21 judgments that God uses to to destroy the forces of wickedness. 21 judgments. And all throughout Revelation, God's calling people to repent. And the vast majority do not. But God loves to reach out to the lost. People like Muhammad to call them to faith. Uh, But it says in Psalm 110, uh, verse 2, as God's working out his plan, as he brings his son uh, to the Davidic kingdom, it says he will stretch forth his strong scepter from Zion, in verse 2 of of Psalm Psalm 110. He will stretch forth his strong scepter from Zion. Zion uh, uh, is is, is just a code word for Jerusalem, that he will rule and reign in Jerusalem. Uh, It's also a word used throughout the the Old Testament, uh, Zion, for the Temple Mount proper. So Zion can be the city of Jerusalem. It can also denote the Temple Mount. And when you read the book of Ezekiel, uh, chapters 40 to 43, Ezekiel gives you the the architectural construction of the Millennial Temple of the Messiah, 
where he changes the topography of the land, the mountains, uh, and, uh, and builds his, his temple from which he will rule and reign for a thousand years. And he will do this, as it says in Psalm 110, he will stretch his scepter of, of rulership from Zion. And it says, interestingly enough, that he will rule in the midst of thine enemies in, in Psalm 110, verse 2. He will rule in the midst of thine enemies. So when Jesus comes back, follow me on this, Jesus comes back, second coming, tribulation now ends. He judges the sheep from the goats. If you're a sheep, meaning you're a, a person who lived through the tribulation, you're a Christian, you then walk with your physical body into the kingdom. If you are not a Christian, you're, you're thrown into eternal judgment at that point. You're, you're a goat. Uh, but then those people that walk into the kingdom with their physical body in the next thousand years can still have children. Remember? We come back with Christ, uh, according to Revelation 19, uh, to rule and reign with him. We who've already been in glorified, we come back to rule and reign as well. Uh, but those people who walked into the kingdom with the physical body can still produce children. Those children are still born with uh, Adam's sin nature. Romans 5, 12 to 21. And all you have to do is read uh, the, the text to understand over time, those young people, farther you get away from the second coming of Christ, will rebel against Christ. Shocking. And that's why it says, he will rule in the midst of thine enemies. Because the enemies will be those children that are born to those believers who eventually don't want God to be their, their rulership. Isaiah chapter 2 says that Christ will reign and rule from Jerusalem. Verse 2. This happens to be one of my favorite texts in the Old Testament. It says, Now it will come about in the last days that the mountain of the house of the Lord in Zion will be established as the chief, chief mountains. So when Jesus returns, he changes the topography of the planet to where the Mount of Zion will be the tallest mountain on the planet. And on that will be the, the millennial temple. And he will, it will be raised above the hills, and all the nations will stream unto it. Many peoples will come and say, Come, let us go to the mountain of the Lord, to the house of the God of Jacob, that he may teach us concerning his ways, that we may walk in his paths. For the law, the Torah, will go out from Zion, the word of the Lord from Jerusalem. And he, the Messiah, will judge between the nations. He will render decisions for many peoples. He will, they will hammer their swords into plowshares and their spears into pruding hooks, and nation will not lift up sword against nation, and never will they learn war. Where does that take place? Well, it takes place on the planet after the second coming when Christ sets up his kingdom. Uh, he, brings, he brings peace, and the nations flow to Jerusalem to worship and learn from their Messiah. But it says in Psalm 110, verse 2, that Jesus, when he rules and reigns there, will rule in the midst of his enemies. Again, who are the enemies? Those are the children born to the people who walked into the kingdom, who survived the tribulation, who were believers. Zechariah chapter 14 tells you that much. Verse 6 says, Then it will come about that they who are left of all the nations that went out against Jerusalem will go up from year, each year to worship the king, the Lord of hosts, and they're going to celebrate the Feast of Booths. And it will be that whichever of the families of the earth does not go up to Jerusalem to worship the king, Jesus, the Lord of hosts, there will be no rain on them in their countries. And if the family of Egypt does not go up and enter, there will be no rain to fall on them. And, if, and, and it will be a plague which the Lord will smite the nations who do not celebrate the Feast of Booths. This will be the punishment of Egypt and the punishment of all the nations who do not go up to celebrate the feasts. So if you follow the chronology of Zechariah, uh, chapter 12, the world hates Israel and wants to destroy them. Uh, chapter 13, the Messiah returns. Uh, the people, the Jewish people turn to Christ. Uh, they realize who he is. Chapter 14, he destroys the forces of evil. He sets up his kingdom. And in his kingdom, the, the, the last of all Jewish feasts, they observe in the kingdom age of the Messiah, the Feast of Booths, Tabernacles, where they remember yearly. Remember what it was like to go on that earthly sojourn when we seemed like we were in the desert of sin and evil, but God provided for us? We we're going to remember God's provision. And the nations that say we don't want to do that, well, Jesus doesn't say, oh, I can tolerate that. No, he goes, uh, no, I'm going to bring plague against you. And who are those people? Those are the people born to the children, you know, children born to the people who walked into the kingdom who were saved. And within that thousand years, with the devil locked away, the ultimate rebel, man will see how rebellious he is. Remember Flip Wilson? Five people here are my age. Yeah, yeah. What was he always saying? Well, the devil made me do it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you can't use that argument anymore. That's what will happen. Psalm 66, uh, verse 3 says, uh, 
Say to God, how awesome are thy works. Because of the greatness of thy power, thine enemies will be feigned, uh, give feigned obedience to thee. Um, this is an amazing text, uh, Psalm 66. Uh, uh, Dr. Feinberg, uh, who's now with the Lord, great uh, Jewish convert to Christ, the great teacher of Hebrew and Old Testament at Talbot Seminary back in the, the I think, the 70s. Uh, awesome man. Um, says of this text uh, that the word here, feigned obedience, concerning the Messiah is, is really the word, if you look at the lexical meaning from the Hebrew, it, it, it means to lie. It, and he says what this means is when Christ rules and reigns from Jerusalem, that people within time will lie to his face in their worship to him when they hate him. You see? All foretold in what Psalm? Psalm 110. Psalm 110. It says in verse 3, that during the time of the Messiah's reign, thy people will volunteer freely in the day of thy power in holy array from the womb of the dawn. Thy youth are to thee as, as the dew. I love God because God loves gardening. <laughs> the dew. What is this text all about? He's telling you when Jesus shows up and he's the king of kings, the Lord of lords, he's dealt with evil and he's setting up his empire. He's building his new temple mount and everybody's gonna get to go learn from the feet of Jesus. Who in their right mind would wanna miss that? He's, you know, he says, no, when that happens, everyone is going to line up to say, hey, 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 choose me to be the governor of whatever, Seattle, whatever, pick a city. Pick me, pick me. Let me, let me, let me rule and reign with you, Jesus. Because that's what it says here. Thy people will volunteer freely in that day. And he says, the youth are going to be like the dew. He said, when you get up in the morning and the dew is like all over the grass, he said, that's going to be like it is in the kingdom age. There's going to be so many people when the, the day arrives for the king to set up his kingdom, he's not going to have to worry about people to volunteer for political office. They're going to be everywhere. And, and Jesus sets up his rule and reign. Boy, does he. Isaiah 32, verse 1 says, Behold, a king will reign righteously and princes will rule justly. They'll rule with him. Matthew chapter 19, verse 28. Uh, Jesus says this. Truly I say to you, you who followed me in the regeneration of the Son of Man will sit on his glorious throne. You shall also sit upon 12 thrones, judging the 12 tribes. He says that to the disciples. He says, man, you're going you're gonna to rule and reign with me. When? In the kingdom. I love uh, the, the parable of the king's servants. Uh, Psalm, or it's a... Uh, Luke 19, verses 11 to 27, where God says, based on what I entrusted to you, when I see you face to face in the second coming, and I see you, and I judge you as my saint, my sheep, I'm going to reward you with rulership rights. And the, the more faithful you were with what I entrusted to you here and now, I will make you a ruler over 10 cities, you over five cities, you over three. What, what cities? Well, the cities of his empire. Amazing. Psalm 110 identifies Jesus. It, it explains his role in a twofold fashion. We'll look at the next part next week where he's uh, the ultimate high priest. But today he's your king. He's my king. I made him my king in 1967. Uh, I pray that Muhammad makes him his king. And I pray that if you don't know the Christ, you make him his, your, your, that he's your king. How do you do that? Uh, simple prayer. God, forgive me a sinner. And thank you for being my king. Happy Independence Day. You're free as Americans and you're free as Christians. Uh, God be praised. Let me pray for you. God, thank you for the opportunity to open the scriptures, uh, to, to dig in uh, to the inspired word from David. And we look forward with great anticipation for the arrival of the King of Kings. Amen. Good to have you today. God bless you.